Hey guys, it's Joel Richardson and this is The Underground. Welcome to this episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, in this episode, we really are going to zero in on the testimony of the biblical prophets, current events, and how those things together uh, are interrelated and how they relate to you and me. So the question I want to talk about and explore in this episode uh, is, have have we entered the last days? And of course, the answer to that is, I would say, yes. Uh, ever since really the first century, we've been in the last days. But are we in the last of the last days? Has the first seal in the book of Revelation been broken? Have we entered that final period before the return of Jesus? And this is a, uh, it's a discussion that I'm hearing a lot more of throughout the body of Christ. And so I thought it would be important to look at the scriptures and um, explain why I believe that we are not by any means in the final seven years that the uh, first seal of the book of Revelation has not been opened. Now, for what it's worth, uh, this discussion is going to sort of be just a free-flowing stream of consciousness. I really don't have a message prepared, so to speak. I just want to uh, share my perspective, share from my heart, and again, open the scriptures and look at these things together. So before I do, let me just begin by explaining, again, the reason and the context for this discussion. Okay, so we are now, I guess, five or six months uh, into the coronavirus. It's now, um, this is being recorded a day before the 4th of July. Uh, 2020. So for those who have been in quarantine, we've been in for quite a while. And of course, the coronavirus, corona uh, means crown. So it's the, the crown virus, so to speak. And so when people look at the book of Revelation, they look at the first seal. Let's go ahead and actually read this. And then we're going to go back into the Old Testament and then come back to this again. So in Revelation chapter 6, Verse 1, it says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse. So the first seal is the release of the first horse. And this horse, of course, is a white horse. The first, uh, the four horses of the apocalypse, as they're often referred to. And he who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So because the rider on the white horse um, has a crown, people, they look at the name of the coronavirus. They say, well, corona means crown, and the rider has a crown, and therefore we must uh, be in the last days. The first horse of the apocalypse is, is marching forward across the earth, is galloping across the earth, as is the rider. And this is it, okay? So this is, again, a popular idea that's floating around in the body of Christ. Now, before we come back to um, analyze the veracity of this claim, I want to begin by saying that um, this type of thing is not new, okay? There are numerous, numerous prophecy teachers and voices, and I don't want to name names because I don't want this to come across as any type of personal uh, criticism. But there have been numerous prophecy teachers, very well-known prophecy teachers, some less known, that have been making identical claims for a very, very long time. Okay, so one of the very popular claims that I still hear to this day um, began back, I don't even know what year, what year was Chernobyl? I mean, that was in the 80s. And you have a lot of people that say that the Chernobyl uh, meltdown um, was essentially one of the signs of the last days, the breaking of the seals. Um, they, point, they point to this um, great star that falls from heaven in the book of Revelation called Wormwood, and some people point to that as Chernobyl, and, and so on and so forth. And so 
Uh, this is one idea. And you know, whenever you have a teacher teaching this type of thing, you're gonna have a school of people that uh, hold on to that. So again, let's say we're talking back in the 80s. Again, I don't remember the exact date, but roughly 30 years ago. So you've got those that believe that 30 years ago, the first seal of the book of Revelation uh, was opened or that we've been in um, the period defined by the book of Revelation as the last days for at least the past 30 years. Okay, so that's one popular idea. Um, there's another author um, who I have really recommended uh, for what it's worth his books. I've disagreed with his interpretation of this particular issue, but he teaches that the conquering of Saddam Hussein, when he conquered uh, Kuwait and his sort of marching forth, that that was actually the marching forth of the first horse of the apocalypse. Okay, so similarly, that's like 1991-ish. Um, I guess I had just got out of high school. 91, 90, 91, I think, 90, 90, 91, the first Gulf War. Um, so again, 30 plus years or so since the first horse, the first seal, um, you know, we've stepped into that period. That's another, again, idea floating around the body of Christ that many people believe. Um, there's uh, another teacher that I'm friends with that says, no, actually, it was not Saddam Hussein. Rather, it was ISIS. The establishment of the ISIS caliphate is the fulfillment uh, of these things. And so you have... Uh, for those three, you probably have 10 more. Um, I don't track with a lot of these things, but you know, we could do a whole show just laying out all of the different ideas that say we are already in the final period of the last days as defined by the book of Revelation. The first seal has already been broken. The first horse is already marching forth and we're just waiting for the next seal for the next horse, okay? So let me begin by explaining why I don't believe this to be the case. Now, uh, we have to start with hermeneutics. We have to start with how to properly interpret the Bible because this is a huge problem. And it's, you know, if I can be transparent, it's a huge problem for everyone. Um, how to rightly divide the word of truth, how to rightly understand the scriptures. It's a complicated topic. It's, it's a science and an art. Hermeneutics is not just a, a science. It is a science and an art. But I, I always begin with this basic principle, and I hope that everyone can agree with this. We need to approach the Bible from the same lens that Jesus and the apostles would have approached it. And so what that means is essentially that we don't simply turn to the book of Revelation and look at a particular portion of the book of Revelation or even anything in the New Testament for that matter and develop a theory from there and then go back and try to make the Old Testament fit. We begin at the beginning. We begin with the foundation. Okay, again, I've, I've been harping on this quite a bit uh, recently, but for Jesus and the apostles, their Bible was the Old Testament. And to understand the Jewish mindset, the Old Testament is structured in a very straightforward manner. You have the books of Moses, you have Torah, you have the Pentateuch. That's the foundation. That is the foundation of all prophecy, uh, of all revelation, and then the writings, Along comes David, etc., etc., and then the prophets, and they're simply expanding upon the words of Moses. They're expanding upon the prophecies of Moses. And these different ideas, theological concepts, they develop, they sprout forth, they blossom, they bloom. And then the New Testament is largely an expansion on those things as well. Okay, so we don't begin at the end. We don't start building our house with the roof first. We start at the foundation. And this is really what defines the difference between reformed or covenant theology, which is largely amillennialist or amillennialist and also replacement theology or supersessionist theology. Um, that's, that tribe, that camp is largely going to uh, argue against what I just said. They say, no, you begin with the New Testament, and that defines the Old Testament, okay? Now, futurists or premillennialists or dispensationalists, um, I don't consider myself a dispensationalist. I consider myself a premillennialist. I would say that I, um, I try to adhere to the theology that I believe Jesus would have held to, Jewish apocalyptic, first century Jewish apocalyptic belief, okay? We won't get into all of the details of what that entails, 
But the difference between these two camps really uh, begins with their hermeneutic. And so for those who are premillennialists, for those who are dispensationalists, for those who embrace a first century uh, intertestamental Jewish apocalypticism, the idea is that you begin at the beginning. Now this is not simply a, a debate between two different segments of the body of Christ, okay? Because if you frame it that way, people will go, well, I'm reformed or, you know, I'm a Calvinist or my pastor or my church or whatever is in this camp and therefore this is the So people take sides. For me, this is simply an issue of basic common sense. This is a, an issue of simple basic common sense. This is the way that all of life is interpreted, right? You begin at the beginning. When ideas and concepts are introduced, whether it's a person introducing an idea in a conversation, whether it's God introducing theological ideas and concepts to mankind, you begin at the beginning. You don't begin at the end. This is the way communication, this is the way language works. This is the way mankind communicates. This is the way God communicates. He begins with a foundation. He begins with ideas. And then throughout the scriptures, these ideas develop. This is, again, this is simple common sense. This is simple sort of communication 101. You begin at the beginning. And again, of course, Jesus and the apostles would have started with Moses. They would have started with Torah. They would have started with the Old Testament because they didn't even have a New Testament. Okay, and the Jesus and the apostles were not reinterpreting, reimagining uh, all of the things that the Old Testament said, God's promises, these type of things. No, rather they reiterated, they affirmed, they expanded upon, they established the things that God had already said. Because the God of the New Testament, Jesus, is the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is Yahweh God Almighty in the flesh, okay? There's so many different passages that prove that. If you disagree, uh, look at John 12, 42. Who are they talking about? It's talking about Jesus. What is it referring to? It's referring to Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Yahweh. I saw the Lord God Almighty exalted on his throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Around him are all of these living creatures crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, that is who Isaiah saw. He saw Jesus. He saw his glory, and thus he spoke of him. So we can look at many other passages. This is purpose here is not to defend uh, the divinity or the identity of Christ, but it's important that we do reference that because unfortunately there are many who reject basic biblical uh, theology. Okay, so how would Jesus, how would the apostles have understood these things? They would have understood the Bible through this, this very simple uh, arrangement. Torah, the writing, again, the Tanakh, the Torah, the uh, Ketuvim, the Nevim, the Nevim, the Ketuvim, history, and the prophets, the Nabi, the prophets. Okay, so with that said, before we jump to the book of Revelation to try to understand timing, what is the foundational Old Testament passage or passages that we should look to to understand the timing of the last days? Okay, because again, Jesus is introduced, the Messiah is introduced in Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, this foundational uh, first gospel that's all the way back there in Genesis, and then throughout Torah, throughout the writings, throughout the prophets, throughout the Psalms, the idea of this coming one, this crushing one, the Messiah, the King of Israel, it's developed, it expands, we have new revelation, Isaiah adds all types of new information, but it's not until, specifically, um, I, could, I would argue Jeremiah chapter 30, but it's not until Daniel, it's not until, I mean, quite late in the development of Revelation that the Lord spoke through the prophet Daniel and he gave us a, a critical foundational passage that explains the timing of the final period of indignation, that explains the final period just before the return of Jesus. And this is, of course, Daniel chapter 9 the prophecy of 70 weeks. Now, if you're not familiar with this, um, I did a few uh, undergrounds, a few sessions on this during the Maranatha Global Bible Study just over the past few months you, on the underground or wherever you're watching this. Just go back a few episodes 
um, or a handful of episodes, and you can find a much more expanded examination of Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks. But needless to say, it's a very critical and very specific prophecy. A time has been uh, set aside, it's been cut off for Daniel and for Daniel's people, for Israel, for Daniel, uh, Daniel's people, okay, so the people of Israel. And ultimately, again, without overly elaborating, um, Daniel was studying, meditating upon the words of Jeremiah and uh, concerning this period of 70 years that they were in exile in Babylon. He realized the time was up. He's fasting and praying. And in the midst of this, the Lord sends uh, Gabriel, the archangel. And Gabriel shows up and gives him new and fresh revelation. And he talks about a period of 490 years, 70 times 7. And then he breaks up this 490 year period into a period that leads up to um, the coming of the Messiah and the cutting off of the Messiah. And then you have a gap. And this is really controversial. A lot of people go, oh, there's no gap. Everyone has a gap. Virtually every passage in Daniel has a gap. It begins with events of history. There's a long gap. And then it zeroes in and it focuses on the final period, the final period of indignation, which Isaiah talks about, which Moses, by the way, referred to. But it's Daniel that gives us the exact time frame. And that time frame is seven years. Seven years. So I'll go ahead and just read that rather than simply tell you what it says and what it means. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Again, the Jews and Jerusalem. And then he lists six things. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint once and for all the holy place. I added the once and for all. Okay, so you've got these six things. Verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, specifically to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks, okay, so that's seven times seven, 49, and 62 weeks. So 62 times seven, don't make me do the math together. Uh, it adds up to 483. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress, verse 26. Then, at the end of the 62 weeks, in other words, at the end of the 69 weeks, um, because it's 62 plus the first initial seven, at, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Okay, so this is the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Messiah, the Prince. He will be cut off and have nothing. And then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, many people often interpret that as Titus and the soldiers, the Roman soldiers in 70 AD. Um, that very well may be the case. I personally believe that it's ultimately just speaking about the Antichrist. Um, and its end will come with a flood. Um, or the end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be wars desolations are determined, verse 27, and he, that's the Antichrist, now it gives us some very specific uh, information, will make a firm covenant with many for one Shavuah, one Shavuah, um, and a lot of discussion has gone into this covenant. What is it talking about? Um, I know Dalton, when he was teaching on this, said this has nothing to do with a peace treaty and this type of thing. And then I argue, and he essentially Dalton says, no, this is simply a reaffirmation of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, or even uh, ultimately the everlasting covenant, you know, which is expanded upon in the Mosaic covenant and the um, Davidic covenant. Okay, God's promises to give the land of Israel to the Jews. Now, I agree with Dalton. Okay, I believe that this is ultimately entails an affirmation, a reiteration, a strengthening of, a reaffirmation of the Abrahamic covenant or the larger covenant of God's unfolding eternal promise plans to Israel. Uh, however, I do believe that within that, within the Mosaic covenant, as part of God's covenant with Israel, um, they agreed not to make covenants with the people in the land that they were going into. Okay, so don't make a covenant. Don't enter into marriages, treaties, alliances, uh, these type of things with the pagans. If you do, it will be a snare unto your feet. 
And so Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 28, he really was warning against this. But this is a, a consistent repeated theme throughout the biblical testimony to Israel. Don't enter. Like, God takes marriages very seriously. Remember this when it comes to businesses, when it comes to co-authoring books. Um, unfortunately, I've learned that lesson long ago in the past. Um, be very careful who you join yourself to in ministry, in any of these things, because God takes marriages very seriously. Marriages have dramatic ramifications, right? Um, you know, any, I just had my 23rd anniversary. Um, once you say, once you make a covenant, you're, you're in marriage particularly, you're, you're joined until death. And so the Lord takes these things very seriously. Ultimately, uh, he commanded Israel not to enter into alliances, covenants, treaties with the pagans. If they did, he says it would lead you astray. It would be essentially the death of you, a snare unto your feet. A snare is not a stumbling block. A snare is there to kill you. And he says they will lead you astray into worshiping their gods, into idolatry. Ultimately, it compromises you. So I believe that when it talks about this covenant here, the Antichrist strengthening this covenant, in the larger sense, it's referring to the Abrahamic covenant, but I also do believe that the covenant with death that Isaiah talks about in chapter 28 is a prelude of Israel's ultimate final disobedience of Torah when they enter into a some type of a security agreement, is what I would guess. Again, we, we don't know this for sure, um, but I think there's a solid scriptural case for the idea that the Antichrist will make an agreement, a covenant, with Israel. And by doing so, they will have disobeyed God. Isaiah warned, he said, the covenant, your covenant with death will be annulled when the overwhelming scourge passes through. This is the language of a flood with whips, of waves with whips. And the language of a flood is the language of Satan, of the Antichrist, entering the land. The chaos of the water, the chaos brought forth by Leviathan of the beginning, the chaos at the beginning, um, the chaos oftentimes Pharaoh, king of, uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt was, um, his armies were referred to as, um, as bringing a flood. The Antichrist will bring a flood. So when these armies sweep through into the land of Israel, he says it will be like, um, uh, you know, like a tsunami of, of whips and it will be a covenant with death, okay? Because you disobeyed the Lord, You've made a covenant with death. So I believe Isaiah was ultimately prophesying not just to the events of his day, but ultimately looking forward to the last days. Okay, so it's a seven-year period that begins with a covenant. It begins with someone reaffirming, at the very least, the Abrahamic covenant. And then I'll continue. But in the middle of the week, so in the middle of the seven years, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. So he puts a stop to the offering that will be taking place in the temple of God, as it's called. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, ultimately the Antichrist, even until a complete desolation, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So the one who makes the temple desolate himself will be desolated by the Lord himself when he returns in blazing fire. Now, throughout the book of Daniel, um, he reiterates this concept, these two themes, the ceasing of offerings and the establishing of the abomination that causes desolation. So it's spoken of first in Daniel chapter 8, roughly verses 9 through 12, 13. Right in there he talks about the ceasing of offerings, the abomination that causes desolation. He talks about it here again, Daniel 9, 27, very clear. It's a very specific, definitive uh, time marker that we need to pay attention to. He refers to it again in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, and then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. So four times throughout the prophecies of Daniel, he speaks of this definitive time marker, the ceasing of offerings and the setting up of the Antichrist, the abominable one in the temple of God. And that is the middle of the final Shabuah, the middle of the final seven years. Okay, so this really becomes, so anyone, any first century Old Testament literate Jew who understands the foundation, who understands the Bible, when they talk about the timing of the last days, this is the passage that everyone is going to look to. Okay, and it defines the last days as being the specific period set aside, cut off seven years for your people and for your city, Jerusalem. 
Okay, so any discussion in terms of are we in the final seven years or has the first seal been broken, has the first horseman of the apocalypse, uh, has he gone forth? It has to be understood in the context of Daniel 7. Are we in the final seven years? Now, some people could say, well, maybe later Jesus in the book of Revelation defined a much broader period, just a long period that leads up to the final seven years. People could argue that. I would argue that a careful examination of the Olivet Discourse, this is Jesus' specific sermon on the last days, Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21. We're going to look at Matthew 24 specifically, as well as the book of Revelation's specific delineation of this final period follows the pattern of Daniel chapter 9. They don't rewrite the script. They stick with the foundation that has already been laid. Now, how do why do I say this? I don't say, how do I know this for sure? But why do I believe this? Because when you carefully analyze Jesus' sermon on the end times, the Olivet Discourse, he also points back to the abomination of desolation, the ceasing of offerings, as the definitive midpoint, the definitive time marker for the final period of the last days. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us about the timing. Tell us about the signs of the last days. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so Jesus gives them a sermon. He begins by laying out a series of events. He says, but don't worry, that's not yet the end. That's just the beginning of birth pains. But then comes the abomination of desolation. So let's go ahead and look at Matthew 24 just to see how important uh, this abomination of desolation was to Jesus and how all evidence just on the surface really seems to indicate that he is following the script of Daniel. He's pointing back to Daniel. He is pointing back to, I mean, ultimately the acts of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a prototype, a foreshadow of the Antichrist, but ultimately pointing to the ultimate last day's Antichrist, of which Antiochus Epiphanes was just a forerunner, just a prelude. So Matthew chapter 24, sorry, I'm one chapter ahead here. The disciples come to him, we're not going to go through it all, and they ask him privately, you know, when is this temple, when's the temple going to be destroyed in the future? He's not talking about 70 AD and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And he starts laying in, he starts laying out, uh, elaborating on all sorts of different signs. And he begins by saying, verse 4, see to it that no one misleads you. Don't be deceived, don't be misled, don't follow false voices. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will mislead many. Now, interestingly enough, there's really two ways that this can be taken. This can be taken as saying false Christs will come, false messiahs, saying, I'm the messiah. You know, David Koresh, whoever it might be. I don't know if he claimed to be the messiah. He claimed to be the lamb. Um, I don't really know about the theology of David Koresh other than I just watched the uh, documentary, which the um, sort of the series, which was, which was really good. Uh, but many will come essentially claiming to be the Christ. That's one way to interpret it, and I think that's probably the proper meaning. But the other way is that many will come, and they will affirm the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. They will come claiming to be Christians, saying all the right things. Oh, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. I affirm the death, burial, and resurrection. And then they will mislead many. And if you think about it, that is the most prevalent danger right now. You think about some of the voices, prominent voices in the body of Christ, some of the things they teach and say these, um, these personality, um, these personal affirmation, sort of just positive life coaches and so, so, so forth, um, giving, barely giving lessons from the scriptures, you know, you're good enough. Yeah, this type of thing, and you go, um, that doesn't seem to jive with what the scriptures say. I'm actually not good enough. That's why Jesus, you know, these type of things, right? So they come claiming that Jesus is the Christ, but they deceive many. Um, it, it's amazing how much deception people can get away with if they use a lot of Christian lingo, if they wrap their deception with a veneer of, of Jesus and hallelujah and, and Christian lingo and so forth. It's um, that's a big issue. However, I would say probably verse 4 is ultimately referring to false messiahs. So he says they will mislead many. Okay, so the first sign that Jesus specifically talks about is the coming forth of false messiahs. Now, let's go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation because this is so important. When I first saw this, I went, duh, 
I mean, yeah, hello, this absolutely parallels what Jesus was saying. So in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, um, we already read this with regard to the, the first horse. The first seal is the white horse and the rider on the horse. We notice that the book of Revelation is essentially a, an exposition, an expansion upon Jesus's all of the discourse, Jesus' sermon on the end times. The book of Revelation follows the pattern that Jesus laid out. Likewise, Paul the Apostle does the same thing in 2 Thessalonians. When Paul talks about the last days, he also follows the specific pattern that Jesus laid out. So again, the rider on the horse, you've got the white horse, he who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, so he's given authority to rule. Um, he's given a bow, he's conquering. He goes out conquering and to conquer. So the first sign is an individual on the white horse that is conquering. Now, if you follow my perspective on the last days, I believe that he is primarily, first and foremost, consolidating regional, Middle Eastern, North African power. He is consolidating power throughout the Middle East. I believe this is talking about the Antichrist. I believe this is not the rider on the white horse that comes back from heaven. This is a false in, uh, false Christ, okay, not in the sense that he's a false Jewish Messiah, but he is Satan's man. He's Satan's man who is attempting to gather together the, um, the inhabitants of the earth, the peoples of the land, under his authority. Okay, so first you begin with the Antichrist. Well, again, notice Jesus begins by talking about false Christs, claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be the big man, claiming to be whoever it might be, various Messiah figures. Okay, so that's the first sign. You go, okay, that seems to line up. Now notice Jesus' next statement. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. So false Christs, wars and rumors of wars. What's the second seal? Verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another red horse went out. And him who sat on it, it was granted to him to take away peace from the earth and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to them. So a sword taking away peace, war. Okay, so Jesus says false Christ, we have the Messiah marching forth. The next seal is war. Jesus says you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't worry though, it's not yet the end. What is the next statement that Jesus says? Um, See to it that you're not frightened, those things must take place, that is not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation. Again, ongoing division. Uh, which in many ways is what we're seeing, which is exactly what I warned about maybe a year ago. Go back and watch the message that I gave concerning civil war in America. Um, it's devastating, but in many ways it's happening. Satan is succeeding uh, in terms of what he wants to do, in terms of dividing the nation. It's essentially a repeat of the Arab Spring here in the United States. We've entered into incredibly dangerous territory, but I believe that it's a mere prelude to what's coming a mere prelude to what's coming in many ways on a global scale. Racial tension, ethnic tension, which is what eth kingdom, uh, nation against nation is, ethnos against ethnos, um, socioeconomic division, the rich versus the poor, uh, political ideology, Marxists versus capitalists, on and on and on. Nationalism, one nation against the next, religious conflict. Satan is going to do everything he can. Gender, I mean sex, between male and female. He is going to use everything he can to divide the world. And the church needs to be wise to the wiles and the schemes of Satan. And unfortunately, I would argue that many of us are falling for the wiles. We're taking sides, we're casting the other side purely as the enemy uh, with very one-dimensional thinking. And yes, there's a lot of evil. Um, you know, Marxism is evil, and so on and so forth. Um, but Satan has us believing that people are far more, the vast majority of people are far more one-dimensional um, than things really are. And most people who are on the other side, who are slightly to the left of us or to the right of us, um, they are complex. People are complex, and our opinions are complicated. And most often, they're not extremists on one end of the spectrum. They're somewhere in between, and they have a range of ideas. Most people out there protesting, they're not all radical Marxists. You have plenty that are. But it's very important that we recognize the complexity, the messiness of life, the complexity of people, and that we don't judge everybody and stick them in this 
uh, this demonized category, because that's exactly what Satan wants us to do, is polarize, is further divide into increasingly hostile, hostile adversarial camps until we're all divided, and then divided we fall, okay? I know a lot of people are going to get upset by me saying that because they believe that it's all just right versus left, and that defines everything, but it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. We need to get to know people individually, one person at a time, through face-to-face -face conversations, incarnational. We need to get in people's space and get to know people's feelings, their history, why they lean toward a particular idea. And in doing that, we diffuse a lot of this, this division, this perfect storm that's in the United States and all over the world, um, exacerbated by social media and distance and anti-incarnationalism, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, that was a side message, but I mean, we're in the thick of it. Okay, and then he says, then there will be famines and earthquakes. So he says there's going to be war, division. The next sign that Jesus mentions in verse 7 is famines and earthquakes. What is the next seal? The third seal, verse 5, famine. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. So he is um, dealing with uh, inflation and so on and so forth. And I heard something like the voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So ultimately, uh, a loaf of bread is like a day's wages. Dramatic global inflation, hunger, famine, pestilences, some of these things. Okay, that's exactly what Jesus mentioned in the order that Jesus mentioned them. Then the next seal, verse 7, is death. The lamb broke the fourth seal, and I heard the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen, or a pale green, or, you know, chloros in the Greek, like a, like a dead body. An ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following him. Authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and pestilence, wild beast, death, okay? We've seen a prelude in Syria. Probably, realistically, official numbers are like 500,000, half a million to 600,000 dead in Syria over the past nine years since the, Arab, since the Arab Spring, since the Civil War in Syria. And um, ultimately, these things are coming to the whole land, to much of the world, and it's going to be absolute chaos. What does Jesus say? Then they will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another. Once the bloodshed begins, once the death begins, that's when the emotions absolutely go through the roof. In the United States, I've been warning, we're, we're at a tipping point. Every time you see someone drive into a crowd and start shooting or you see this, that, every time there's a new video of some cop making a mistake or getting caught in an extremely difficult situation, whatever it may be, emotions are heightened. But once there's genuine bloodshed, once people's family members, friends, neighbors are killed, there's no turning back. There's no turning back, and then the division, the snowball is out of control. But again, Jesus' delineation of the last days follows the exact pattern of the book of Revelation. What's the fifth seal? When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, Jesus said, then they will turn you over to be killed. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long? So there it is, martyrs. Okay, martyrs under the altar. So the point here is, again, I wanted to do just a very brief overview, but just to show you a side-by-side, -side, back and forth comparison between Jesus' sermon on the end times. Again, Jesus, although he's God Almighty, he is an Old Testament literate Jew. He is going to look back to the definitive foundational text in the Old Testament that gives us timing. When his disciples come and they say, tell us about the timing, he expands upon and he elaborates upon Daniel chapter 9 and the larger testimony of Daniel. He highlights Daniel. And of course, there are plenty of ideas that he highlights which have, uh, they, they come from other prophets and other passages. It's again kind of a crescendo as the master 
the master weaver weaves this tapestry and explains the last days, but then ultimately Jesus is also the inspiration behind the book of Revelation as he reveals this to John. And so in the book of Revelation, um, Jesus is simply inspiring a reiteration of what he's already laid out, what he's already laid out. So the point is this, in conclusion, and by the way, Paul does the same thing. Uh, we could have gone through Paul, we could have done Jesus, Paul, the book of Revelation. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I wanted to be brief. In conclusion, and just to reiterate, the Bible primarily defines the last days. It cuts off, it sets aside this period of seven years, okay? These ideas that we are 30 years into the last days, or, you know, the reason that we need to be so careful of these things is because it is fundamentally arbitrary. When someone says, oh, um, Chernobyl is one of the seals being broken, or Saddam Hussein is one of the seals being broken, or ISIS is one of the seals being broken, I go, why is it that within the body of Christ we have so many different ideas, and they all do their best to defend these different ideas? Um, I would argue because it's, it's rooted largely in personal opinion and guesswork, speculative opinion, trying to force the puzzle pieces to fit, without beginning with, again, the basic biblical foundation of understanding that it's a seven-year period. And that seven-year period begins with the strong affirmation or the reiteration or the making of the covenant, the going forth of the Antichrist, consolidating regional power, and, is, and essentially establishing himself as the individual that um, has enough political capital that Israel would want to enter into a covenant with. Um, and so, as opposed to sticking from a biblical framework, I would argue that these other perspectives, yes, of course, they use the scriptures to defend their positions, but they're usually starting from the back and then going back to the Old Testament and trying to reverse engineer this original theory. Um, and it's also very arbitrary. It, it's, it's very similar when I say arbitrary. In other words, it's just one person says this, another person says that. Who are we to know who has a better argument? You know, you go, well, that kind of fits, but it kind of doesn't fit. It's so similar to the allegorical approach of some of the early church writers. You look at the writings of men like Origen, Clement of Alexandria, um, even at times uh, Augustine and these amillennialists, you know, that largely took a... a uh, essentially a slightly Gnostic method of interpreting the scriptures. And they look at some Old Testament event, uh, you know, they look at David and Saul or this and that, and they turn it into an allegory. Well, David represents this. David represents the church. Saul represents the carnal desires of man, you know, these type of things. And they lay out this very elaborate lesson and sermon. You go, you're just using your imagination and you're drawing these analogies from literal historical stories, that's not the primary meaning of the text. The primary meaning of the text is it's a historical story between David and Saul, and it's not about the church and the carnal nature of mankind and our lower, you know, and these type of things. You read some of it and you go, it's, it's very imaginative, it's very creative, it's very well done, but it's completely arbitrary. And then another guy comes along and he looks at the exact same passage and he comes up with a completely different analogy. And the end times, oftentimes, the interpretation of the end times, when they're not thoroughly rooted in, uh, again, a proper analysis of the Bible with a solid Jewish uh, hermeneutic, so to speak, they can often become very arbitrary. And so, listen, we're not in the final seven years yet. I don't believe we're in the final seven years yet. I believe that there's this kind of desire to say we're already there. And I see this in the body of Christ as a teacher. I've seen this for a long time. There's kind of this like, let's get this thing going. Look, I understand the sentiment. Death or the rapture? <laughs> get me out of here. Get me out of this mess. Like, cynically speaking, um, I'm not suicidal, but uh, I, I sympathize with those that are wrestling with depression, right, in the midst of everything that's going on and sadness and grief. We should feel those things. Um, but, you know, bring the rapture on. Like, let's, let's get the show on the road. I understand that sentiment, but the closer that we approach the last days, and this is what I want to leave you all with, the closer that we approach the last days, the more essential it is that we hold steady, that we are sober and we're careful not to jump the gun and say, as Peter rightly said, this is that of which the prophet Joel spoke. Now, of course, he's talking about Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was not the ultimate 
uh, final fulfillment because what Joel was talking about was in the context of the day of the Lord, the great last days outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what was taking place at Pentecost was an interim fulfillment. And thus, Peter said, this is that. We need to be so careful not to say this coronavirus, this racial riots is that which Jesus declared. We are in the final seven years. Um, I'm not sure exactly what year it was. We're here in 2020. I want to say it was 2017. Was it 2017 or 2016? It was a few years ago that you had the convergence of the blood moons and the Shemitah. They all kind of came together toward the fall season, which is a very heightened time of everyone saying, could this be it? Could this be it? And, you know, I went down to Morningside uh, with Jim Baker, my friends down there, and it was just, it was a month or so before the culmination of the last of the four blood moons that everybody was looking to, and then soon thereafter was the Shemitah. They all seemed to converge around the same time period, the Shemitah being seven years to the day. So, yeah, seven years. So, actually, that might have been 2015. Was it that long ago? Um, I thought it was 2016. The end of 20. 18 plus 7, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, 2008, the, the economic collapse. So the Shemitah um, was one day after 9-11. Seven years later, you had the economic collapse. The idea was seven years later, according to the Jewish calendar, on the Shemitah was going to be, the next shoe was going to drop. And every, there was just so much anticipation. What's going to happen? Is it the rapture? Is it this? Is it that? And I gave a, a message there at Morningside, and my message was called preparing for life as usual because what I felt like was the level of anticipation the level of expectancy was so heightened that what we needed to do more than anything was to prepare for the fact that something colossal was not probably not about to take place and if that was true then, if it was true then that the body of Christ needs to be careful not to jump the gun, if it was true then that we needed to hold steady, not to be the boy that cries wolf so as to discredit the biblical testimony, if it was true then, then how much more now? Because we are getting close. And it's time right now, the Lord, I believe, is saying, hold steady, hold steady, hold steady. And at the right time, he will say, this is that. And the maskalim, those with understanding, we need to be people of understanding. We need to be careful. Um, there's another prophecy that's going all over the internet right now. Uh, he's a pastor that gives a series of dreams, and many people are watching it and filled with anxiety and fear. Joel, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And he's essentially saying things are just going to get worse and worse and worse toward the end of the year, particularly in the United States. He had these dreams. Could be, could be, could be. Um, my response to that, what do you think about that, Joel, is essentially the same thing that I felt when years ago, years ago, I listened to a recording of John Paul Jackson's prophecy called The Perfect Storm. I listened to it. I gave it, um, I gave it the time. And what struck me as I listened to both John Paul Jackson's Perfect Storm prophecy and what struck me when I listened to this other prophecy, again, that's it's all over the internet, is I was filled with anxiety, filled with fear, probably anxiety. And I said, this is not good. I, I feel like I need to get bullets. I need to prepare. I need to do this. I need to do that. And I've learned over the years, I don't ever act out of anxiety or fear. If I feel like I have a solid revelation or understanding or a sense that something is coming, then I will prepare and get ready. But I will never act based on anxiety and fear because it never produces anything good. And if I were to make a prediction, yeah, look, I think there's a lot of turmoil ahead, but the idea of what he describes as complete anarchy, people are talking Mad Max type of stuff. Um, I don't think that's what the United States is going to look like by the end of the year. Um, ultimately, John Paul Jackson's Perfect Storm Prophecy, if you really go back, I don't know if the original files that I listened to, where he lays out the years, he's like 2015 is going to look this way, 2016, etc. He goes through the years. He was wrong. He was flat out wrong. I mean, he talks about 
he, seeing visions of um, backhoes in the streets ripping up tar so people could plant gardens in the inner cities because everything was so chaotic. Economic meltdown was so severe. I mean, it just goes on and you're like, this is the end of the world. This is the end of the world in terms of what I've ever, ever experienced. The bottom line is, in terms of the timing, John Paul Jackson was wrong. And we need to have the courage to say people are wrong. And so in terms of this prophecy that's going around, my response is this, hold steady, watch and see. Don't allow anxiety and fear to overwhelm you. And if it's not true, then this dear brother that shares these visions, he needs to take account, he needs to take responsibility for that and step forward. I would say the same thing of there's a handful of different voices out there um, in the charismatic movement that have prophesied going all the way back to March um, talking about the end of coronavirus, they declare the end, or they prophesy the end, or they saw the end very soon, and it's not near this and that. We're in July, and and I understand the death rates are dropping, and a lot of people have all kinds of different feelings, but the bottom line is it did not diminish. We're five months into this thing, and it is ramping up. And people who made those prophecies should come forward and take responsibility and say, I was wrong. The things that I prophesied and the, the, the hope that I offered, uh, I was wrong. And I think it's important that when we make declarations and we're calling on people to um, take actions like reinvest your finances and do those type of things, it's important that leaders take responsibility. It's important that prophets say, hey, I, I blew it on that one and I, I, I want to man up and, and, and state that. I think people at this day, in this day and age have far more respect for that. Um, that type of humility than they do that those just to move on and, and ignore it or try to, you know, explain it away and say, oh, actually it is true if you look at it from this angle and this type of thing. We've seen enough of that, right? Okay, guys, so that's enough for today. I hope that um, the heart behind what I was saying uh, is clear. I'm not trying to poo-poo anyone. I'm calling us to a sober, uh, a sober-minded spirit because now more than ever, we need to be sober-minded. The times that we live in demand as much. These are desperate times. Things are getting intense, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Uh, it could be soon. It could be soon, or it could yet still be a ways out. As I always say, for those that are pouring themselves into biblical prophecy, studying the scriptures, it's like sometimes we think we've got the timeline all understood. And then we realize the timeline that we've taken all this time to draw and explain. The Lord revealed it to us on a rubber band. And we're looking at it, and all of a sudden the Lord goes, woo, woo, <laughs> you know. And all of a sudden, five years rolls by. And you look back and you go, man, I, I didn't, you know, time rolls by quickly. And so I thought I had the timing understood, but oftentimes we don't. And the Lord is patient and kind. He doesn't want any to perish. And the world doesn't revolve around the United States. And there's, there's other parts of the world that are very relevant. Uh, the end times is not contingent on what's going on in the United States or in other parts of the world. It's contingent on Israel and her neighbors and the covenant that God made with Israel. So amen and amen. I hope this was helpful. Uh, again, friends, let's be sober. Let's hold steady. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. <laughs>